we'll do this. So you were telling me that, first of all, can you tell me a little bit about your airplane that you've had in Paoli at Lee Bottom for, you know, the last little bit? Tell me what kind of airplane it was and what, what you got interested in it about. It was a 1944 uh, slash 45 uh, uh, airplane built by Bolte uh, Aircraft, uh, the Stinson Division of Bolte Aircraft for the Army Air Corps as a liaison airplane for uh, artillery spotting and uh, delivering messages and ferrying brass around. Well, I gave Alexa a ride in it um, way back when. I've got a video of that uh, if you want to see somewhere along. I can email it to you. Um, <clears throat> the, this, the 44, it's registered as a 1944, uh, but that was the year that the Army sent the requisition of the order for it, and it wasn't delivered until 1945. But it's 1944 L5 E uh, at, I'll make sure to start again. L dash five E as an echo. Um, it has um, flaps that lower on the inboard side of the wing, uh, like a normal airplane does, but the ailerons also will lower for takeoff and landing, so they get virtually a full span flap effect that really gives it a lot of um, short field takeoff performance. Uh, landing also. Um, it was the Army um, specifications when they when they asked Stinson to build these airplanes um, before the contract was awarded. They said um, it must take off and land within 500 feet and preferably within 350 feet. So uh, I have seen uh, a couple instances of it working inside of 350 feet. Uh, Uncle Bill used to uh, have, he had one and he used to land it on a farm in uh, um, hay fields and just anywhere he could, uh, as in a, uh, you know, if the farm hands were out there baling hay and they needed more baling twine, he'd throw a couple of bales in the, of the twine into his airplane, take off from his strip there in, uh, uh, in Selkirk and uh, fly out to the uh, one time he flew out to Fear Bush uh, where Uncle Will Herber uh, had a farm that we were uh, haying. He landed there. I think he did it more just for, I don't know, it wasn't, it would have taken him. <laughs> I, yeah, I think he could almost have uh, driven there almost as fast, uh, but uh, it was just a fun thing to do. Um, I, I was corresponded with an a Army aviator who flew those. I don't know how old he was. I don't think he's even alive anymore, but he described in the training where they trained at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. He said, we do two types of landings, short and very short. And uh, uh, they, they actually uh, would, uh, on, on a normal uh, airplane, you, you pull the power back to near idle, you know, lower the nose and glide down toward, toward the end of the runway. But what these guys would do is they would raise the nose into a almost virtually a full stall. The, the leading edge of the wing had uh, what they call a, a slot in it. Uh, it was about, I, I can't remember exactly the dimensions. It was three bays, three between three ribs. Uh, there were three sections uh, of open air there. And you could actually, hold a stick full back in a stall and still have aileron control so you can keep the wings level. And it came down like a streamlined crowbar. Uh, and uh, the Uncle Bill used to do it because the guy that he bought it from showed him how to do it. But it, it actually get down and just before he crash into the ground, he'd give it a, a shot of throttle, just boom, uh, to, to break the fall. But this guy that told me about it, he said they would actually raise the nose and lower a wing into what they call a slip and skew the nose to the one side or the other so they could see out the, the side window because the nose was so high they couldn't see over it where they were going. And they would increase the power to almost full throttle. Uh, but the airplane is in a stall so it's coming down and uh, they come down and, and uh, by the time they got the, the full power in it was it would be enough to break the 
the rapid descent and they touch down and immediately get on the brakes and they could stop within uh, probably this 350 feet uh, and was, with room to spare. So uh, Uncle Bill had, uh, his strip was 900 feet and it was, it was no problem at all to land in half of that. Uh, so it was, it was a really fun airplane. That's why I bought it. Uh, like I said, I uh, just fell in love with it when I flew it uh, after I got my private pilot license in 1961. Uh, I flew it for well, probably 15 hours or so, and uh, it was just it was just a ball of fun, then. and uh, so I thought, well, I do the same thing that, and, but that's some extenuating circumstances that uh, uh, it, it had uh, when I bought the guy out in, from a guy in Denver, he had put some uh, cylinders that, on it that were not approved for that model engine, and. Uh, he operated it 25 years that way. His inspector is the one that did it. So uh, the inspector didn't see anything wrong with it. And he, he signed it off as being okay. But I, I thought I could get somebody to do that for me also. Then I got the thinking of, you know, if I sell the thing or, or even have, even myself, I had, a, you know, say a, a flat tire and a ground looped it or something. And the FAA got in the act. They'd go through the law books and they'd find these, uh, this, uh, these number, these model cylinders on there, which weren't approved, and they say, "Who signed this off?" And they'd go find him and, and just you know, rip up his license to, to be a mechanic. So, I didn't want to jeopardize anybody's career like that. So it, that's why it set there for the, it expired. The annual expired in 2006, and it hasn't flown since. It's just been there parked. Um, so is it is it? Um still put together or did you already start to take it apart to try and fix it and then didn't or unable to get it it's it's more or less together I, I opened up the inspection panels took the seat out uh, and the floor panels out so that the inspector could look at it uh, and there's a couple of things that i wanted to change on the battery is installed in the lo wrong location which makes it tail heavy it should be mounted on the back of the front seat and it's mounted behind the rear seat. So it's way back there and it's a lot of weight that, uh, uh, when a friend of mine who had an L5, he's actually the brother of the guy that owned the airport and that we bought him. When he flew it, he said it felt like it was really heavy and uh, that was his term for it. So uh, anyway, this, it, it, uh, it needs some, tinkering. I mean, it could be made variable probably within a few hours, right. put all the panels back on and uh, get a, a temporary ferry permit, but it has some things that uh, just really ought to be cleaned up. The oil pressure gauge, for example, which is very important to have, uh, should be uh, connected directly to the engine, and it's not. It's an electrical connection, and it only works when the battery is turned on. And uh, so if you turn off the, the master switch, for example. It's like turning off the ignition in your car. Your radio doesn't play, not, the headlights may not work, or et cetera. So uh, it, it really is not legal to be that way. And, uh, gotcha. But, um, well, so you've been storing it at Lee Bottoms, and I, I know no, no. The, the guy that owns Lee Bottoms Airfield is also a UPS pilot, so that's how you all met? No. Um, it's stored at Paoli, but I, I used to fly in the Lee Bottom, they, they live, I mean, Lee Bottom is in, in um, Madison. Oh, just, okay. just the Louisville side of Madison, uh, I don't know, three, four miles. Uh, it's right near a big power plant there on the river. Uh, it's, on the Indi it's on the Indiana side, <clears throat> and it's a grass strip right alongside the river. And uh, every year in September, they had a fly-in. They'd, they'd get three or 400 airplanes from all over the country to come in, from DC-3s on down to you know, little single place airplanes. And primarily what they call tail dragger airplanes with a wheel on the tail, not a nose wheel. And so I went over there a few times uh, and a, a friend of mine, John Davidson, it was a UPS pilot, still is. Uh, and he had the same model airplane. And so we, we palled around together a little bit. Uh, he came over to Paoli and we, I got some pictures of both our airplanes together. Uh, but his brother was a pilot for, I think, Chautauqua Airlines. I think they were a, a commuter, uh, I mean, like a, what do they call it? A, 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 
for they had a uh, I think it was American Airlines they they worked for they I mean they had uh, uh, American Airlines or whatever the airline was uh, uh, trip numbers but they only had these little airplanes that held maybe I don't know 50 air passengers or something like that it's just a you know, two two seats one one row of seats on either side of the aisle and one flight attendant and uh, he worked for them for a number of years but then uh, he got hired at UPS mm, I want to say maybe seven or eight years ago it was after we moved here to India uh, to uh, New Hampshire okay but uh, the, the that airplane airport uh, has a 501c3 certificate and uh, because their, their their mission is to create a, a heritage for old airplane I mean uh, not a heritage but a a, um, a respite a place to go for you know, old airplanes and people of, of that interest they're interested in those, interested in those can get together and have a book out I mean they usually make it a three-day weekend they they have a like an evening meal on Friday or something, you know, cook out and you know, goes into Saturday and Sunday. Um, but the, with a rising cost of fuel, it's up over $5 a gallon now, I believe. Um, wow. you know, it's, it's really stymied the, the uh, continuance of it. There's a lot of people who want to have the flying, but they don't want to do anything to help make it go. Uh, they just, and it was free for a long, long time, but then they started charging a an admission fee, I've forgotten, $10 or something minimal, uh, but that's still not enough to cost them. You know, yeah, they have to mow the airplane, the airport, it's grass, so they have to be mowed several times a year. Um, that all costs money for fuel and maintenance on the tractor and mowers when it breaks down. And uh, there's just a whole sort of, um, you know, a plethora of costs that go along keeping, and it's just John, uh, just a day, uh, yeah, Rich and his wife. Uh, that are doing it uh, and there's occasionally somebody will pop in and maybe put a camper up for a, a few days or something to help out but it's rather you know catch as catch can uh, they don't uh, have anything you know that they seems like all these things are labors of love for all of us <laughs> yeah. Yeah, only because we love it and not because we're getting paid I get it yep so what I want to do now, because I feel like the audio, do you, in, in future, because I, I do want to do this with you again, um, do you have a microphone that you can talk to? I think that's one of the... Does it make any difference if I'm closer to the microphone it, this it way? Makes, it makes a huge difference. Oh. Yep. Okay. Yep. But I wouldn't want Let you me... to have to, to be that close. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I didn't even think about that. I. I have a, a, a actually that, a, that actually that right there. If that's comfortable for you, it's good. But I don't want you to be uncomfortable. No, that's no, that's fine. It's not a problem. Okay. Um, well, well, so now that I can hear you pretty good, can you just take me through? And I don't know if you can do this quickly, but your career progression and interest in airplanes. So I know that basically you started um, taking lessons when you're in college. And you know, then you flew the mail, and then you had d different airplanes that you flew, and then you retired as a captain on the 747. Can you just take me through kind of your iteration of airplanes and, and what you did? Well, the start after I when, let me start a little bit before I started college. <clears throat> I had always wanted to fly um, since I can remember, especially since I knew that Uncle Bill had an airplane. Uh, but mom was terrified of airplanes. She was new. She just knew that, you know, I set foot in one, I was going to be killed and then she'd lose her son. So uh, dad was was not averse to my flying, but he always presented a united front with, with mom. And uh, so basically what she said went, he agreed with her. And uh, so I never was allowed to fly uh, in an airplane until I got to college and then out of sight. Uh, you know, they didn't know what I was doing, and so I, I discovered this airport. Um, it was about four mile ride, drive, I guess, from the college uh, on uh, Lake Makatawa uh, in uh, Holland, Michigan. And uh, so I made my way out there, and the, um, of course, it was just filled with these old tail dragger airplanes. This is 1961, uh, and I just hung out on weekends. Um, pumping gas or um, polishing airplanes uh, 
you know, just something to, you know, be busy there. Uh, and uh, started working with this uh, flight instructor who had, well, first of all, I got a ride in an airplane. It was a Piper Vagabond. It was a two-seater side-by-side, little yellow Piper airplane, a PA-15. Had a stick in the, um, it had two sticks actually side by side. It was two seats side by side. And um, it was an upper classmate. He was a junior in, in uh, I'll take that back. He was a sophomore. He was a year ahead of me in college. <clears throat> and uh, he had just gotten his private license um, a few weeks before. And uh, he had belonged to a flying club there on the field. So uh, somehow I talked him into uh, uh, taking me up for a ride. And uh, so he gave me my first airplane ride ever. This was probably in September of uh, 1961. And it's that that's what really, you know, made the spark first turn into a flame. And I, I just started hanging out up there as often as I could. I'd hitchhike out, use my thumb. Back then, it was pretty easy to get a ride usually. And there was some, weren't so many crazy people uh, as there are today. But uh, hung out there at the airport and uh, like I said, answer the telephone or talk, you know, gave advisories on the, what they called a the unicom. It was a little two-way radio between uh, the, the airport office and uh, airplanes that were in the traffic pattern or, or coming in from wherever and tell them what the active runway was, what the wind was, uh, that sort of thing. And um, I just um, met the flight instructor there. It was uh, on the field and he uh, had a little side business. Uh, he and a, a mechanic, they would repair airplanes, um, do engine overhauls, they would do fabric uh, re recovering of the airplanes. And uh, I, I couldn't afford $20 an hour. That was his, uh, his rate for the, the airplane and the instructor. Uh, so uh, anyway, he just decided if I wanted to work for him, he'd credit me for a dollar for every hour I worked for him. But a dollar an hour was, was good money back then. So we never exchanged uh, any money, uh, but we just kept the tally. And when I had 20 hours uh, work, he'd say, come on, Jim, let's go fly for an hour. So we do that. And um, after I soloed, well, actually, I didn't solo then until I quit, after I quit college, because when I, since back then the regulations uh, stated if you were under 21, a minor still, you had to have your parents' permission to solo. So obviously mom and dad weren't going to do that. So I, I went back home after I quit and uh, I hung around uh, Glenmont there for um, spring and, and part of the summer. And um, I, they, they finally, uh, mom said, well, I guess you're you know, dead set on doing it. I, we're not gonna stop you. So they signed the, uh, the permission for me. And I started flying with a, a flight instructor up north of Albany in what they call Lath uh, Loudoun Airport. It was north of Latham, which is a, a suburb of north of Albany. And uh, it was about a probably a 15 to 18 mile drive from home to that. But I did solo there. And after I soloed, I, I flew a few more hours and then, then I don't remember the exact, exact time frame, but somewhere along toward the end of summer, I went back to Michigan and I worked uh, uh, full time for this uh, instructor and his mechanic. Uh, I say full time, it was about eight, hour, eight hours a day. And then I had a, a job at night at a four star gas station, pumping gas and closing up the station at night. Uh, that was just to get money to buy food and uh, uh, put a roof over my head. I'm trying to think, oh, I know. Well, I didn't pay for anything. I, I slept in a hangar in, out there at the airport. There was, a, I don't know, half a dozen big old blankets in a, in a sofa on an unused hangar there. And so I just slept on that. Uh, healthiest uh, winter I ever spent. Didn't catch a cold at all. Up in Michigan. I think it's pretty cold up there. Yeah, it is. Uh, but, you know, the bugs don't uh, like the cold and uh, I didn't mind it, and uh, so this was went on into the uh, uh, winter of December of '61. Uh, I think it was around December 15th or 16th. I uh, 
I had an appointment to take my private pilot flight test in Grand Rapids. And it was about a, I've forgotten, it's 25, 30 miles away. It wasn't too long a flight, maybe 15 or 20 minutes, something like that, maybe not even that long. But I had an appointment for one particular day and it was windy or an all get out. It was below zero, there was ice all what runways. I took off, went over there and uh, landed at Grand Rapids. The inspector came out and he said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm here for my check ride. He says, oh, the weather's too bad. He said, I, I'm not, I'm not going to fly with you today. So I went back home by myself and came back, I don't remember, a day or two later and uh, passed the, the test. And uh, uh, anyway, once the, the test was passed, I uh, came back to Albany. Uh, I think I took dad and my brother, R Uncle Ron, and Uncle Rick uh, rented a four-place Cessna 172 up there in Loudoun, and we went over to Vermont. I wanted to show Dad what his homestead there, where he grew up, looked like from the air. So we did that, and uh, Dad was just tickled pink to you know get over there and see all that stuff from the air. And uh, came back, and um, about I don't remember what I did in the ensuing ten or so days. But uh, I enlisted in the Navy December 28th, I think it was, of uh, 1961. Thought I'd, uh, I originally wanted to go to the Air Force, but uh, the Navy had a program where uh, you could train uh, as a pilot if you had a certain uh, college experience or a certain test score. I think you needed two years of college as a minimum and, uh, but if you got over a hundred and I think it was 105 points on this test score, it's a weird test because it it's over a hundred percent. But uh, anyway, uh, it, it was a combination of two tests. Over 105 points you could qualify without a college, uh, uh, any college. So I got 130 points on the test. And I thought, well, wow, I'm in like Flynn here. But they uh, said, uh, if you've been to, you know, somewhere around, I, I mentioned that I'd gone to college and they said, well, since you've gone, we'd like to see a transcript of your grade. So I thought, okay. So I sent off for the transcript and uh, came back, uh, back when you're 19, you know, you, you, how <laughs> smart we are. <clears throat> I, uh, I didn't realize there was a, such a thing as a withdrawal that was preferable to a to stopping attending classes and I I had just stopped going uh, it took them about two weeks and they said well where have you been and uh, I said well I've been out of the airport I'm like doing that better than school and anyway they had recorded every class as a failure had it been a you know if I'd had a, somebody tell me dummy you need to say it's you know withdraw formally but I was just um, you know just so you're so excited to fly. I know. Uh, that's, that's right. <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> that, that queered the deal for my Navy uh, pilot training. And uh, I, I had passed all of the other tests, uh, the uh, uh, physicals and the, the interviews and whatnot. Uh, but they didn't like that, uh, that grade uh, score on the college thing. They probably figured I didn't have the, the uh, perseverance to see you know, some, uh, a project through from beginning to end. So I went to, a, I became an aviation engine mechanic, went to a school in Memphis for uh, two different schools there. I was number one out of 30 in one class and number one out of a 160 something in the other class. Uh, so if you give me something that I'm interested in, I can do fairly well in it. But you know, if it's, if it's uh, stupid stuff like calculus with analytic geometry or uh, studying German or uh, speech or a bunch of these other things. I just, so anyway, that big screw up probably set me back uh, 10 years in my progression as a pilot, but uh, it's like Frank Sinatra uh, song says, I did it my way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was a, crew member on the, these flying boats. It was a P-5M amphibian airplane, excuse me, a seaplane. It was not an amphibian airplane. It took off and landed only on water. 
we could put wheels on it. Uh, they had a flotation tank on the wheels. They float them out to the airplane, and uh, we we could physically uh, attach them into a bracket on the plane so that the airplane could be moved around on a ramp with a, a, a tug uh, moving it, but uh, it couldn't move under its own power. So after I got out of the Navy, <clears throat> uh, I I didn't I, I mean, a lot of my friends uh, re-enlisted and stayed in. I, I didn't like working for people that were above me, senior to me, that I thought were uh, didn't know as much as I knew about a lot of things. And so I uh, got out and uh, pursued uh, uh, the flight school uh, route. Uh, 1960, I got out in 66, September of 66. And uh, in uh, September, October of 67, I started uh, at National Aviation Academy in St. Petersburg, Clearwater Airport in Florida. And uh, it was uh, about a six month course. I got my uh, commercial rating, uh, multi engine rating, flight instructor ratings, aircraft and instrument, ground instructor, aircraft and instrument, uh, flight engineers written for DC 6, uh, written past. Uh, a lot of people were using those still back then, the PC sixes. Uh, <clears throat> and um, then I worked there as an aircraft engine mechanic uh, for the air, for the school for I don't know two or three months I think it was. And then in uh, Norma had come to the Philippines by that time. She she came in March and I think it was along around June that we drove back up to New York and moved in with mom and dad in the basement. And uh, I got a job uh, at, uh, at the Page Aviation uh, at Albany Airport, Page Aero, I think they called it. It's, it was a big, uh, what they call it, fixed space operation, but it was a chain of, there were a chain of them around the country. They had one on Washington, D.C., one in Albany, and I don't know where the other ones were. I think it was probably half a dozen or more. And they said, um, I wanted a job as a pilot, uh, preferably as a co-pilot on a, on a, like a twin engine Beach 18 or something that they had. Uh, and um, the chief pilot said, well, we don't need one right now. He said, we've got, a, got an opening coming up in a couple of weeks, so we might be able to use you. I said, uh, well, you know, I, I need some, I need some work. I, I had to stop when, when we drove up from Florida. I had to call dad at the throughway uh, exit toll booth. Uh, they let me park on and, and call him up uh, on their phone because we didn't have cell phones back then. And I said, dad, can you come down here to toll booth and, and lend me some money to pay for the toll? I, we, we were plumb out of money, just I didn't, didn't have the money to pay the toll on the turnpike. Right. So anyway, I told the chief, I said, well, I need something to do for a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, I needed to eat and uh, whatnot. So uh, he said, do you need a, a mechanic? He said, do we need a mechanic? <laughs> <laughs> just lost my, my, my earbud fell out. <laughs> um, he said, when can you start? I said, well, I've got my tools. Uh, you know, they were in the trailer. I said, this was, I think, maybe a Friday. He said, can you start Monday? I said, sure. So Monday I was there, excuse me, uh, and I worked there for two weeks and a month and then two months and I saw pilots being hired and uh, they, uh, they weren't talking to me at all. And uh, can you still hear me? Yep, yep. Okay, my, uh, it sounded different. Uh, these are noise canceling things. I guess I didn't have it in my ear far enough because it sounds different now than I did uh, <clears throat> anyway, he basically said, well, pilots are a dime a dozen. We can't find mechanics, so we're not going to put you in a pilot slot. So I toughed it out for a year there. And uh, finally, one day, it was just a, a straw that broke the camel's back or my back. Uh, uh, they didn't have any work to do. They had a contract with a state airplane there, a, a Beach King Air that the New York State uh, used to fly the governor around in the big wigs, and um, they uh, they did inspections on it, maintenance for it, among others. It had a they had a helicopter. There was 
two other airplanes also. But the, everything was all caught up that day, and uh, they didn't have anything for us to do. So uh, the boss, the night shift boss, says, "Well, you can sweep the floor." I said, "I'm not going to sit here and sweep the floor for eight hours." So I, uh, my mistake was I didn't punch off the clock. Uh, but another another mechanic and myself went in the back, and uh, we started working on my motorcycle part that I was <laughs> I was doing a valve job on a cylinder head for it. <clears throat> And uh, uh, the boss, uh, the lead, the foreman there came in the back and he's, he went uh, to the boss up front. Anyway, to make a long story short, I got fired. Both of us got fired. So um, that was good, I guess, because if, if I hadn't gotten fired, I, I'd still be there as a mechanic. Uh, they never would have put me on as a pilot. So um, I went to, got, got another job. Um, just a day or two later at a motorcycle shop and I stayed there for uh, three years uh, repairing uh, motorcycles, um, snowmobiles, that sort of thing. It was in Latham, uh, not too far from the airport actually. <clears throat> so, but I did uh, freelance flight instructing uh, at a little airport out in New Salem. They had a Cessna 150 and uh, they had a couple of them and uh, a little gravel strip of 1800 feet long. It went up a uh, hill, you couldn't see one end of the runway from the other end uh, because it went over, it was on the other side of a hill, there was like a big hump in the middle of it. But I stayed there uh, for a couple of years uh, as a flight instructor. And uh, then I went to Duanesburg uh, Airport, and uh, it was uh, a little village about 20 miles west of Albany on Route 5. And uh, got a job there working for a Another instructor, he stayed home most of the time just to let me work. Uh, and I was there for, I don't remember exactly how long, six or eight months. And then an opening uh, uh, came up at South Albany Airport, which was just about a mile as the crow flies from where mom and dad's house was. <clears throat> so I work, went to work there and I was there for probably two months. The, the, the chief instructor there had to put a nice little ad in the local paper about Jim Thayer was uh, on staff here, you know, uh, and listed my ratings and whatnot. And I had uh, several students. We flew at Ronka Champ, which was a uh, little 65 horsepower tail dragger, and he had another Cessna 150, and uh, maybe a 172 also. Uh, but that lasted about a month, maybe two. And one day I was in the shop in the back doing an inspection on his airplane, <clears throat> and he said, there's a phone call for you. So I went and answered the phone, and it was nobody I knew. It was uh, this guy, Bill Gilly from Syracuse, uh, New York, had, was just making cold calls around the state there trying to find somebody who would be interested in being a co-pilot on one of his mail planes because his other pilot had quit. And uh, so I, anyway, asked uh, the pilot, I was, chief pilot I was working for, I said, well, what do you think? And he said, you better go for it. He says, you may never find an opportunity like this again. So this was a Friday. He, he said, be down in Binghamton Monday for a Monday night departure. <clears throat> so I got down there somehow uh, before Monday night and uh, uh, met this captain that they had. And uh, uh, that began my career for uh, flying night mail. It was, um, I'd have to think of for sure what the, what the year was. I think it was 1971. Uh, and uh, I worked for Gilly for about a year and a half. After about four months, he let me check out as a captain. I said, you're giving me these dingbat captains. There was a new one like every two or three weeks. And uh, some of them were, didn't know as much about the airplane as I did. And uh, I was afraid we were going to get hurt. So uh, anyway, he gave me a check ride and, and promoted me to captain. And I, I worked for him as a captain about a year after that. And then a fellow by the name of George Toby from Hartford. I don't know if you ever heard that name before. I, I, I remember George Toby, actually. Yeah. I remember going to his house in Rhode Island. Is that what you said? Yeah. Uh, he lived in uh, Wethersfield, Connecticut. <clears throat> but um, his male pilot uh, by the name of Jim Dole uh, wanted to uh, quit and, and start his own little freight outfit. So 
he asked me if I wanted to take his place. And I said, well, sure, for two reasons. Uh, first of all, it was a single pilot operation. I didn't have to have a co-pilot, which I didn't, I didn't get along real well with some of the, their shenanigans. Uh, most, one of them I had was a, a ex-Navy pilot, and I, I know he would have crashed the airplane had he not, had I not been with him, because he just was incompetent. So I, I just, you know, sometimes people rub me the wrong way, and I, I, I try to be diplomatic, and I usually wind up just being quiet, don't say anything, rather than get upset and, and you know, uh, make them mad at me. But anyway, the, George had an autopilot in his airplane, so we didn't need a co-pilot. The, the post office required either a co-pilot or an autopilot. So, and, and the other thing was that George kept his airplanes in tip-top shape. All of Gilly's airplanes, uh, I had to carry a case of oil in gallon, six gallon cans, or I mean six each gallon cans in the back. And each stop, after stop, and, and put in a gallon uh, each each stop to keep the thing from running out of oil. Uh, George's engines, uh, if they used over a quart of oil on a trip, an entire trip, he'd change the engine and get a new engine. He just wouldn't put up with that nonsense. I said, well, that is wonderful. So I worked for George for three and a half years. He loved me. Uh, started me out at, uh, uh, I think it was $300 an hour and uh, $300 a week, I mean, $300 a week. And uh, at Gilly, I was making 200 uh, So, and the co-pilot got 100 So Gilly was spending the same price. He spent $300 for the crew. George spent $300 for one for pilot. And after, I don't know, a year or so, he, he said he'd pay half my insurance. And then after another year, half year or so, he picked the whole thing up. So I was getting uh, what eighteen thousand a year uh, plus my medical stuff, and um, that lasted until uh, June thirtieth, nineteen seventy six, when the post office canceled all of the mail contracts nationwide, and they started putting everything on trailer trucks. They didn't fly anything uh, for several years, and I somewhere along I don't know because I wasn't involved in it then. Uh, they picked up. Uh, they started contracting companies like Evergreen to fly DC-9s that they put mail on. And uh, they actually were, painted, actually were painted in post office colors with a white, with a red and blue stripe on it. It said U.S. Postal Service. Uh, <clears throat> but that was after I'd gone to work for uh, uh, Interstate Airlines. And uh, um, anyway, in 76, uh, I didn't have anything to do, so I got... I was still living there in, in Scarborough, and uh, I needed a job. Well, I needed a job, but I, I, I didn't want to move anymore. Your mom and I uh, together had moved uh, half a dozen times, I think, since we were married in 73. And uh, I had moved about 12 times uh, since I'd been flying uh, night mail in 71. and. I, I just was tired of, you know, getting a new address and finding, you know, mail that never caught up to me uh, type of deal. And, um, so we decided to stay there and I found a job working for Joe Caruso at Maine Aviation as a charter pilot. And uh, I was flying a Cessna 310s, which is a twin engine, low wing airplane, cabin airplane, holds uh, basically four people plus maybe a couple of kids in the back, a total of six if they were really small. And I did charter work for them. He was affiliated with Bar Harbor Airlines. His brother, Tom Caruso, owned the Bar Harbor Airlines. And occasionally, they'd need extra lift. And the main aviation had a Cessna 402, which was a, a larger cabin class airplane than a 310. It held another, I think, another, I think a total of eight people in the back. And uh, occasionally, I'd get a, uh, a call to do that. and. Uh, take that uh, wherever to go to Bangor or whatever and pick up eight, eight people or whatever and take them to to uh, Boston or wherever the, the trip was supposed to go. So uh, that lasted for uh, about a year. And then a friend of mine, I uh, worked out of a uh, hangar there at Portland. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> Goodness. Bless you. All right. Thank you. 
Uh, he was flying a corporate airplane for E.C. Jordan. They were a, a uh, surveying uh, company. They did surveying, and I forgot what the real title was. They, they did sewer projects for um, different cities around the state. Uh, for example, they, they rebuilt the sewer uh, system in Greenville, Maine. And, uh, but they needed to go, they were just within the state of Maine. And I, I was just a, a glorified taxi driver or bus driver for them. They'd get me up at, you know, go out at six o'clock in the morning and get dropped off at some place. And I'd have to sit there and wait and wait and wait, you know, for them to come back. And, uh, usually they didn't even tell me if they, were, they said, we'll be back at four. They might not come back till eight. You know, is that type of thing, and then I'd get home at ten o'clock, and then there'd be a, a message. Uh, you know, there's somebody else wanted to go out at six o'clock later that same, you know, next morning. Goodness. And, and that got that got old after a very short time. I did it for almost a year, <clears throat> and then uh, a friend of mine uh, that had flown for George Toby also had gone to work for uh, what is now or what at that time was Interstate Airlines in, you know, out of Ypsilanti, Michigan. That's a kind of a next city over from Detroit. And uh, he had called me back in, in the spring of that year of 78, I believe it was, to uh, go to work out there flying Convar 580s. They were a big, in the passenger configuration, they were 50 passenger airplane, uh, two big turboprops on it. and. Uh, uh, it was really a, an airliner in, in the passenger configuration. Of course, the freight, they used to take all the seats out and uh, all the soundproofing, so it, it really is a noisy airplane uh, just because, it, you know, soundproofing weighs, you know, weight, whatever you, extra weight you're carrying around, that's that many pounds you can't put of freight on the airplane. So anyway, um, I didn't go and didn't go because I, I didn't want to be away from you and mom and I don't know if I can't remember this was 78 I can't remember if uh, well initially James hadn't even come then um, when I finally did go he had already been born he was born in July uh, and I, I went in uh, September or October because uh, uh, the uh, anyway this guy called again that fall said uh, so hey what are you doing he said uh, I, I called up to see uh, asked the chief pilot where you were, and he said he'd never heard of you. I said, well, I didn't call him because I really didn't want to be away from home you know, a week, two weeks at a time. But uh, he said it isn't all that bad. And uh, anyway, mom and I talked it over, and we decided we'd give it a try. So that was the beginning uh, of my big airplane experience. Uh, they hired me over the phone. Uh, I went out to Ypsilanti, and uh, they sent me to... I can't remember if I went there first or went to, Alleg to uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, the Allegheny Airlines uh, at the time had the Condor 580s that uh, Interstate bought. And, uh, uh, but they had a, some sort of an agreement with, with them. They, they would train our, our the Interstate pilots to, you know, on the systems of the airplane. So I may have gone to, directly to Pittsburgh. I probably did uh, for uh, probably a two-week school, ground school. And then <clears throat> went out to Ypsilanti and uh, flew in the airplane with the chief pilot, and uh, he checked me out uh, as a, as a first officer, <clears throat> co-pilot, same thing, and uh, did that for I think I was a first officer for just short of a year, something like ten months, and then an uh, opportunity to upgrade to captain came, and uh, I did that, and uh, I was a captain there from then on I never was uh, was a co-pilot uh, again um, after th three years on the conveyor in 1981 the airline got out of the conveyors and they bought three 727s involving seven two sevens a three engine airplane with a T tail uh, the, the tail in the back is up on the top of the vertical stabilizer and set it down below like most of a lot of airplanes. <clears throat> anyway, we f flew that for three years, and then in 1984, uh, Interstate got a contract with the UPS uh, to operate their, uh, I say their being UPS's airplanes. Uh, UPS had several planes that 
uh, three different airlines. So it was there was Interstate, there was Orion Airlines, and then there was Ryan Airlines, and uh, actually there were four, and also Evergreen. And uh, UPS kind of pitted um, each of them against the other. They they have a little score sheet on the all posted on the hall there in the in the air division there, wherever the pilots uh, came in to get their paperwork. And it would say who had the best performance last week, and uh, yada yada yada. They were just trying to, you know, you know, stir up some enthusiasm to get everybody to try harder, I guess. But uh, we did that for uh, until two, uh, January of 1988, and at at that point, uh, just before January, uh, Interstate had negotiated a contract with UPS to operate ten DC-8s. For the upcoming, I don't know what the term was. It was at least for four years and maybe even longer. Uh, but anyway, uh, in January, they pulled the rug out of underneath, out from underneath every all the airlines, and said they were taking it all in house because they didn't, they legally couldn't tell the airline and say we need you to go instead of going from Louisville to Detroit, we want you to go from Louisville to Bangor and then to go to Boston, or, you know, whatever. Uh, they didn't have operational control over the aircraft movement, and that's what they wanted for better flexibility. So they decided to take it in-house and to train their own people. They even had had truck drivers who were, were telling us that they were going to be pilots because, you know, they they'd been with UPS for 18 years and they had more seniority than we did, and they were going to take our jobs. Well, that never happened, obviously, but. UPS was was infamous for trying to reinvent the wheel. They would not take uh, any advice from the airlines that had been doing this for eons. They wanted to, and they stumbled around doing it and screwing it up and uh, uh, slowly learning. Uh, but uh, they, uh, anyway, I, I put off going to work for those uh, stumble bombs until June of 1988, just because I didn't like their attitude about a lot of things. And one time we were before, you know, before June, <clears throat> uh, they had started this program where uh, you had to call uh, a certain frequency. There's a, a, a ramp, a, a UPS uh, driver, in, a manager in a, in a little van out there on the ramp, and he'd give uh, permission for, you know, airplane XYZ to start and taxi out. And then, okay, he said, no, no, A, airplane ABC, you follow him. And, uh, you know, they had this thing all sequenced. They, they thought if they got to the end of the runway staggered enough, they wouldn't be out there sitting, burning up uh, taxi fuel or something uh, waiting to take off. Anyway, they, uh, they, they gave everybody a start engine time. And uh, I don't remember what happened, but the, the crew that, the ground crew I had that day had me start all four engines, uh, but they didn't. Uh, um, I guess they hadn't caught. I didn't. I didn't tell them. Uh, you know, I, I was waiting on a, a clearance, and we just sat there with the four engines turning. And all of a sudden, here comes this uh, manager with his little yellow light flipping around on top of his truck, and pulls up in front. And he gets out, and he says, you know, "Like, he gives me that this signal. Like, I, I made a mistake. I should have shut them all down." But I left one of them running uh, because if you shut them all down, then you have to go back and get get the auxiliary power unit, a big air air pump. To part, uh, they require an air start. Uh, but his whole deal was, I, I was you know like a minute before my my taxi time, and the engines, all the engines are running, and so uh, they just had to micromanage everything. It just drove me nuts. So when when it came time to uh, uh, go to work for them. I mean, they, they had asked me, uh, and I had just been stalling and putting them off for a while. Uh, I finally decided, Interstate told me that they had no, could not guarantee me a job after June 30th. They said, uh, you know, we, we filed bankruptcy uh, because the contract, we'd hired X, Y, Z number of pilots. You know, we got were top heavy with pilots. Obviously, they let them go first, but they couldn't guarantee even the guys that had been there for five years a job. I was there for ten years before before this, so 
Um, I was actually fairly senior at Interstate. I think I was number I don't know, seven or eight or something like that. So fairly decent number out of, I think, about 30 pilots at the time. But uh, I th saw the writing on the wall. I said, well, I've lived here in the Louisville area, and uh, they're offering me a job. It probably is going to turn out to be a, a lot better deal in the long run than, than the interstate is. And uh, interstate never had a union, still doesn't. Uh, they morphed into, they, initially they morphed into ATI, Air Transport International, and now they call themselves Air Group Services or something like this. They've got contracts with the government. They work for uh, Amazon. They work for, uh, uh, I don't know if the CIA still, they, got, they did have a couple of white painted airplanes with no markings on them. They used to use for the CIA when they were flying and stuff with them. <clears throat> so anyway, it, it, uh, I hired on June uh, 28th of 1988. 28th or 27th, I think it was 28th. Now, real quick, pause on this, because it was my understanding that, you know, so you had four airlines that all got their contracts canceled, and then UPS said, we're going to become our own airline, and we're going to hire our own pilots. Mm -hmm. So how many pilots were displaced, and how many did UPS hire? Do you know? They hired about 50% from interstate, and I think maybe about the same number from the others. I, I don't know for sure. <clears throat> One of the things they didn't hire is a, a, another pilot and myself had a beard at the time and um, at an interstate. And uh, obviously they didn't like beards, so UPS didn't. And I saw, you know, that I, this guy says, I'm not going to shave my beard for any other job interview. And I said, well, you know, whatever, you know, do what you want to do. I shaved mine off and I got the job and he didn't. I mean, it was that sort of thing. Uh, one of the things Pat, I did. Patrick O'Leary, do you remember that name? Oh yeah, yeah. Patrick O'Leary um, actually just retired, and he um, I ran into him every now and then. But he said he remembered you, and he said that most of the pilots that he interviewed from all those other airlines, he said they were either flunkies or druggies or whatever. And he said, you know, that his numbers, the people that he hired, was not very many compared to. Uh, the applicants. So he remembered you, and he yeah. um, always said hi to me in the in the hall, which is always. Yeah. Now I had one <clears throat> one experience that they asked me about during the interview. I don't remember. I think it was a border. It was more than Pat. There was two or three others, I think, uh, on the interview. But they asked me about uh, an incident that happened at Salt Lake City uh, when I was still at Interstate, and uh, that. It was an episode that uh, uh, had me the most concerned I think I've ever been in my whole career uh, about the safe outcome of the thing. It was going in uh, on the approach into Salt Lake. We'd taken off out of Denver, come over the mountains, and Salt Lake is kind of d down in a bowl. Time, Daddy. You were, you're, I was not hearing you very good. Oh. So you're <clears throat> out of Denver. We'd taken off out of Denver, headed to Salt Lake City. And uh, on the approach into Salt Lake, you're coming over a mountain range and you have to go down into this valley where the airport is located, Salt Lake. <clears throat> it's right next to the, the Great Salt Lake. Um, and so when I extended the flaps for landing to full, uh, the, something in the mechanism snapped and one of the flaps stayed full down and the other side retracted up to, it was only about five degrees down. It imparted a great big roll movement. Uh, it's like you'd taken the, the control wheel and just cranked it full and so it wanted to roll over on its back. <clears throat> I was able to, to uh, counteract it with uh, using differential power and uh, full rudder and uh, almost, almost full rudder, almost full air. I didn't want to get to the full extremity of it. Uh, um, so that's why we used the differential power to allow partial control so that in case it you know, started to, to go, we'd still have something to, to bring it back with. And uh, we uh, managed to touch down uh, about 40 knots faster than uh, the normal approach speed, but uh, it was under control and nobody got hurt. And uh, uh, 
the airplane was just out of commission for about a month. It sat there for quite a while while they, there was a big, big metallic uh, flat bracket that uh, broke. <clears throat> but it also held the, the, the system. It was a central point for where the, the controls went out to the left and the right wing. So uh, there was no control over anything. You could move the, the flap lever back and forth and it was just not hooked to anything. It was totally on, out of the system. Anyway, they, I guess they thought that I handled it well and got the airplane back on the ground without hurting anybody and um, the airplane was fixable. So um, I think that may have been another thing that, you know, they, they, they liked that. I mean, I have no idea what their criteria is, but <clears throat> the, the ba bad part about it was they had, uh, the pay scale was just horrendous. It was less than half of what I was making at the interstate. I made in that six months at interstate from January 1st to June 28th when I went to UPS, I made more money than I did in the entire 1989 year, January through December. N never mind the, the other six months of 88. It was just uh, the Right. You know, the pay the pay didn't change. It was just about a full year there was still less than what I made in six months at the interstate. But through these the uh, and that's why I changed my attitude about unions. I mean, they, they uh, without without the IPA uh, union, they would never nobody would come to work there. I mean, right now UPS is can, people are leaving. I just looked at the new hire class. People are coming from United. They're coming from Atlas. They're coming from uh, all the airlines, Air, U.S. Air Force, United States Navy. Uh, just, you know, the, the pilots are considered. Are you there? You froze up. Patio. Are you there? Oh, there you yeah. are. <laughs> Didn't you hear me say anything? No, I heard uh, we were talking about the pilots coming from everywhere and then you froze oh, for gosh. 45 seconds. Oh gosh. I just, a flag came on and said, your internet connection is unstable. But now it went away. Yeah, I don't know what's going good. on with it. You know, I've, I've noticed, this must be a high, high uh, bandwidth using thing. I had a, a, a meeting with the, the Failure Family Association directors a few nights ago, and a couple of them have the same thing. They'd be talking, and all of a sudden they just get garbled, and you don't hear anything. Maybe I'm Coronavirus. talking too much. I'm just teasing. No. Man, so you uh, retired as a captain on the seven. So you started at UPS on the DC eight. Is that correct? Yeah, they. I was. <clears throat> I. I was hired as a DC eight captain. And they said I had to stay there for two years because they didn't want to train, retrain me right again. Um, and uh, so anyway, in 1990, I was able to, May of 1990, I was able to switch to the 747. I thought, you know, if I didn't, couldn't stand, at the time, the, the, the job still was not, not a good job compared to what I had been doing. And so I thought, well, if I need to bail out, a 747 uh, type rating is a lot more marketable than a DC-8 rating. The, the airlines were starting to, uh, the uh, cargo airlines were starting to get 747s and park the DC-8s. And so I thought well, maybe I'd go to work for Japan Airlines or somebody like that flying a 747. So that's one reason why I went to 740. Plus it, it's a, just a nice airplane to fly. It's a uh, roomy. Was it scary though going from the, I mean, what was the scariest jump, or did you have a scary jump? It, it wasn't really scary. It was it's actually amazing. Uh, I, I felt more at home in that than I did, you know, in a little air, when I got back in the little ones to jump seat or ride home somewhere. Uh, it, was, it was like getting in a little Yugo or something after you've had a Cadillac. So uh, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, 747, you can get a, uh-oh, I lost you. No, I'm still here. I can hear you. I still see you too. Wait a second. Ooh. 
What, what the hell? I didn't even turn on. I still see you. I you see me? I don't see you. Let me. Let me so at the bottom you. of your screen, is there a little zoom icon? Yeah. Where is it? Here, yes. No. There, there you are. <laughs> I didn't even think I touched anything, but it started playing bongo music or something. Um, the, the, the 747 is a, a, a wonderful office to go to work in. Uh, it's a little bit intimidating at first because you're up so high. It's, it's, eye level, I think, is about close to 30 feet above the ground. Uh, but you soon get used to it, and uh, it, it feels very comfortable. It's easy to make the smoothest landings ever uh, in the thing. Uh, it's, uh, it's just a little uh, easily learned technique and uh, 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 it's uh, just neat to be able to get around and walk back and make a cup of coffee and then sit down in a first class seat to stretch your legs or something while you're, you know, you're going across the ocean. And I love the longer trips uh, like going to Germany or going to Hong Kong or, or Tokyo or uh, Australia, Honolulu, and those things to me were, were neat. I didn't like going to Dallas and back uh, every day to be or Newark and back. They had those for some people liked them because they lived right there in the Louisville. They drive five minutes to the airport and they're home every night. And uh, uh, but you know driving all the way from court and uh, was a little bit um, more than I like to do that often. <clears throat> Well, it's quite the story, Daddy. I'm really, I'm so glad that you allowed me to capture this. I hope actually we can start doing this more often on different topics. So, but I wanted to definitely capture your flight history. And um, it's very interesting that, uh, you know, I've read Bled Brown most of my, my life now since 1988. <clears throat> and um, interesting similarities, you know, I came over, I was a contractor for a lot, a lot of years and they still like me, so. That's great. I don't know, yep. anyway, it's been wonderful. So I really look forward to seeing you. I'm actually going to, um, making your own bedroom back up so that you all can stay in there. I'm gonna fix y'all some food so we can have breakfast oh. and stuff together. And then, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing Good. you. I have one question, I don't know if you can t answer. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I thought I cleaned everything out of that back room where the, I had my radio stuff. Uh, I cannot find a little green accordion folder. It had a, uh, it was like a, uh, it had a, a flap over it, but you, you've seen these uh, expandable folders and it had a, like a black rubber elastic band or something around it to hold it closed. It held the papers for that Stinson. And there's also some other log books for the spare engine that I have. And it, I, I think they should be here, but I've been through almost every box out in the milk house so far, and I can't find it. And I, have you ever seen anything like a that? Green folder, file folder? Yeah, it would be like a green textured, like a textured canvas almost, maybe. Uh, it was a, had a, a, a flap, you know, you could. All, I remember all, a blue one. Mom used to have one that was blue and. Um, yeah. But yeah, you all have that one. But this was a green one, a little di little different shape. <clears throat> Didn't have a handle on it. It was just a a, a pouch with a fold over yeah. flap. <clears throat> I don't think it's there, but I I, I told AC when I you know, the great guy that's going to come pick it up uh, Monday uh, that uh, I've got them somewhere. They're not they're not gone. I just don't know where they are. <laughs> right on. So I'll keep looking here. I just thought maybe you might have seen it when you moved some stuff around yep. out of the attic or whatever. <laughs> okay. I love you, Daddy. Love you too, dear. Have a Thank great you. night. Bye. Bye-bye.